As we think back now over um, the assaults of recent years on figures of the Enlightenment, uh, on some of the specific people we've talked about today, do you share my view that the, that the backlash against the Enlightenment appears to be because of the time in which the Enlightenment thinkers were living? Just the, the happenstance of them living at a time when slavery was ongoing, colonialism was ongoing, and uh, everyone was going to be enmeshed in, to some extent in this. Do you think that that is the reason why they've, they've come under assault, or is there something else? I think there's something else. And the something else is that the Enlightenment has always uh, been suspected uh, in, in many circles, many intellectual circles uh, as well. Um, uh, there are people who, for instance, have uh, traced the horrors of 20th century totalitarianism, fascism, and communism alike, actually, to Enlightenment schemes of uh, utopian social engineering. This is a criticism that often comes from the political right, as we should say. It's very often from the political right, but it comes from the political left as well. Mm. There are a couple of more ways of thinking about this. The Enlightenment people are our people. So in a way, when we attack them, we're engaging in a family squabble. We don't spend an, an enormous amount of time today attacking uh, Martin Luther for his views on the Jews, mm. uh, actually, even though his, some of his writings on the Jews were appalling, in fact. Yeah. Or his thoughts on peasants. Or his thoughts on peasants, either, as a, a mm. murdering, uh, a murdering, a thieving, ro a band of robbers, I believe, so, is one of the titles. That's one of the, uh, the less pleasant things he says about peasants. But, so, so, what, so you're saying that we're focusing on the Enlightenment uh, figures because they remain so central to us. Exactly. We recognize ourselves when we look at someone like Smith, Voltaire, mm. Diderot, or Hume. These seem like modern men. Hume is, was not only the greatest philosopher in the English language, he was one of the best human beings ever, I think. He is certainly someone that we would want to invite over to a dinner party or to a cocktail party or something like that. And I would even venture to guess that if he, being an empiricist, could see what we know today about race relations and about uh, racial realities, both in our own society and beyond. I don't have much doubt that he would alter his views considerably on, on, on the races. He was not averse to changing his views in response to evidence, unlike, I might say, some of the people uh, who seem to be so ready to, uh, to, to attack him. So, so I think that that's that's part of the that's part of the the uh, what's going on. The other thing that I would say, though, is <clears throat> I think one reason why the Enlightenment is perennially under attack is because the idea of a global society, which is basically what we live in today, uh, which is held together not by a system of robust shared cultural values, a shared religion, a shared devotion to one ruler or anything like that, which is the way that most human societies have been held together in the past, but simply by the rules, the norms, the practices, the, the, the loose legal structure that we have around us to hold us in place and to make sure that we do our duties and fulfill our promises and our contracts and so forth, that's not intuitive. Mm. We can see the extraordinary benefits that it brings, but it's not something that comes naturally or intuitively to people. This is something that Hayek, for example, worried about. He worried that people have uh, norms that are left over from our simpler past and that, it's the, that those norms were always going to be pressing in upon our experiences from the right and from the left uh, and making it uh, more difficult than we might like uh, to get people to live uh, together in peace in this sort of global, uh, global society that, uh, that, that, that we live in. Mm -hmm.